Hi everyone, in this video we are going to um, go over a couple examples where we practice reading trees and I also want to talk about a few misconceptions that I tend that I find um, tend to be a little persistent just because of the way a lot of trees that you'll see are are drawn and then finally we'll talk about ways to categorize groupings of branches on a tree so just a little bit of new vocabulary at the end of the video so um this is a, a practice question so according to the tree below which of the following organisms is the frog most closely related to so you've got the frog and then your options are fish human equally related to the fish and the lizard or equally related to the fish and the human. So take a minute and pause this video and decide what you think the answer is. And hopefully you came to the uh, not intuitive answer, but the correct answer, which is B, human. The fish is mostly most closely related to the human out of all of these answer choices. Technically, the fish is, or the frog is equally related to the lizard, the mouse, and the human because all of those organisms shared a common ancestor with the frog right here at this branching point here. Let me get a laser pointer. At this branching point, this node, that's the most recent common ancestor of the frog, a lizard, a mouse, and a human. And more distantly in the past, here's the common ancestor of the fish and the frog. So the fish is the least related to all of the organisms on this tree, or the most distantly related would be another way to say it. So because of this, any answer that includes fish is incorrect. So it can't be uh, A, and it's not equally related to the fish and the lizard. The frog and the lizard are more closely related, and the frog is also more closely related to the human. So if we're looking at this tree, um, looking at sort of the, the most recent ancestor of the frog and any other organism, here we can see that it's, it's equally related to these three on the right. And when you're looking at different ways to draw cladograms, um, one thing to keep in mind is that the order that the organisms appear on the top is irrelevant. It's the ordering of the branches that's the only thing that matters. So I think it's easy to get thrown off by seeing the frog and seeing it next to the fish and next to the lizard. But if you look at these two trees, they both say the exact same information, even though they look very, very different. In both of the trees, if you start down here at this first node, that's where the fish is going to branch off from the common ancestor of all of the rest of the organisms. And that's the same thing for this tree over here. The fish branches off first, and then the common ancestor of all the rest of the organisms comes next. The next branching point is where the frog splits off from the common ancestor of the lizard, human, and mouse. And that's the same thing over here. This second branching point is where the frog splits off from this common ancestor of the rest. The next branch is the lizard, and that's true here. The lizard splits off from the common ancestor of the mammals, and we see that as well here. The lizard splits off from the common ancestor of the mammals, and then the ordering of the most closely related species, mouse and human, doesn't matter. Both of these share the most recent common ancestor, and it doesn't matter which is on the left and which is on the right, because that's, that's irrelevant, irrelevant information. So the ordering of the branches is all we care about. Okay, I apologize in advance, these images are really blurry, but I couldn't find the originals, so um, bear, bear with it. Um, so one misconception is that organisms on the, on the left or the bottom, depending on if your cladogram is oriented vertically or horizontally, are the ancestors of organisms on the right. So some people think that A gave rise to B, which gave rise to C, which gave rise to D. And this is not the case. All of the organisms that are on the tips of the branches exist currently. Um, sometimes you'll see an extinct one, but it's usually noted, and usually people are interested in categorizing currently existing organisms. The ancestors are represented by those nodes. So remember to look at nodes for ancestry and look at the tips of the branches for currently existing organisms. So that's just represented by this picture here. If we're looking at uh, uh, this image here we've got a common ancestor here for this one extinct branch plus currently existing amphibians mammals and lizards another misconception that people tend to have is that uh, taxa or species on the right or the top of a tree are more advanced than those that are on the left or bottom of a tree so that in some some way shape or form species d is like better 
or um, more complicated than species A. And that's not the case. Um, here we're showing a diagram, but remember that branch position and um, cladograms as a whole, evolution in general, we're not always increasing complexity. Sometimes we have a trait evolving on a branch, but we can also get the removal of a trait from a branch. So the branch that gives rise to snakes, for example, you would see the loss of limbs on that branch. Um, and also remember that there's no goal of evolution. Evolution is just um, a change in allele frequency over time, and it doesn't always lead to increased complexity. Um, and then finally, we have a misconception that taxa on the right or the top evolved more recently. And I think that's because a lot of times you'll see um, mammals and um, you'll see mammals on the right and you'll see so like humans will often be on the right of a tree or the top of the tree. But what we're looking at with these trees is we're gonna sort of get, if we're focusing on um, the organism, we're gonna get more branching because we're getting a more fine grained view of the relationship of those species on the right of the tree. Um, whereas the least related organism like tends to get put on the left, but there's no reason for that. We could easily mirror this tree and put the, the least related organism on the right and put these guys all on the, on the left. So just remember to look at the branching order rather than the left to right uh, sequence when you're thinking about um, recent common ancestors and, and that kind of thing. I like this example because it shows humans as the least related organism if you're focusing on things like sea sponges and sea stars and um, hydra. So what, what branches you use and what order you put them in um, is really going to be dependent on what you're studying and who you care about learning the relationships between. So for this example, learning the relationship between different kinds of sea stars is more interesting for this person, and humans are only here to sort of serve as a least related organism. So um, drawing these trees, it's all about the relationships that you care about when you're drawing them. Okay. And then finally, this last slide is just about uh, different ways to categorize uh, groups of organisms. So we've got three words, monophyletic, polyphyletic, and paraphyletic. And um, there are diff different ways to think about groupings of organisms. I'm gonna start with the word monophyletic. And the idea is this, uh, the idea of, of this one is a common ancestor and all of its descendants a common ancestor and all of its descendants. So um, really, if you go far back enough, you could categorize all of life as one monophyletic group, but people are usually looking to have a little bit more fine grained view of things than that. So maybe a more recent common ancestor and all of its descendants. So this is B and then everything that arose from B. And one way to test if something is monophyletic is if you could, uh, sort of snip off one common ancestor, would all of the branches that fall from it fall off in one piece? So if you sort of like snipped right before B, then all of these things would fall off the tree and that's a monophyletic group. Polyphyletic group is a group of organisms that doesn't include the most recent common ancestor. So here we have E and G, and in order for us to find their most recent common ancestor, it would go back to B. But this group doesn't include B and it doesn't so, so it doesn't have the most recent common ancestor. So that's polyphyletic. So if you think about a group that's like, you're trying to group bees and bats, that would be a polyphyletic group because we're not including the common ancestor of bees and bats. I don't even know what that is, but whatever it would be, we would need to include it um, in order for it to be anything else. And then finally, paraphyletic includes a common ancestor, but only some of the descendants. So here we're including A, but if we're gonna include A, then in order for it to be monophyletic, we would need to include every single letter on this tree, but we're only selecting one of the branches. So that would be a paraphyletic group when you include a common ancestor, but not all of the descendants. Okay, so we'll practice a little bit more with that vocab uh, in the coming week or two, um, but I'll stop this video here. Again, this was just sort of a follow-up on the introduction to tree thinking video that I posted earlier. So I'll see you guys in a bit.